Hi, everyone. How are you? Small enough crowd, I can ask. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> Excellent. I am Rachel Heller, co-chair of the Housing Trust, and I am officially starting our meeting tonight. I have to look on the screen and see if we actually have quorum. Um, just to give you a sense of how this meeting is going to go, um, we are spending an hour and a half tonight on our housing production plan. The Housing Trust then has a little business to do, and everybody's welcome to stay and, and uh, watch um, as we discuss the use of some federal home funds. Um, but I want to thank you for coming tonight, and I want to thank everybody who has been part of the housing production plan process. Um, this Tonight's meeting will have an overview of what we've done to date um, and talk about the draft goals and have a conversation about our community vision. Uh, tonight's meeting is a really important step in our process. The housing production plans combine a lot of data about our needs and about residents and, and what they need for housing, as well as the participation of our community. Our current housing production plan is going to expire in May, uh, yeah, May of this year. Um, so our goal is to have this housing production plan done in time uh, for, uh, so that there will be no gap. And just to give a sense, and part of that is because we want to make sure we have continuity. We want to build off of all of the successes of our last housing production plan. Um, our last housing production plan was in 2018, and we highlighted a few key needs. One, we needed to create more housing for seniors. Uh, two, we needed to create more housing options for, uh, for families, especially newly formed young families. Um, and three, to create more options for people with low, very low and extremely low incomes. Um, and we have had a lot of progress since that housing production plan was approved in 2018. Um, most notably was the shaping of the housing development that will be coming to McLean. Um, that project really uh, shows um, how our housing production plan was put into practice. There will be a mix of age-restricted homes and homes that are open to everybody. There will be some homes with three bedrooms that are, are suitable for families with children, uh, you know, for larger families. So it really shows, again, that was those were some of the needs that we highlighted in our last housing production plan. Also, the use of CPA funds has really, um, for housing has really uh, increased over the last couple of years with town meeting dedicating CPA funds for affordable housing production and also for emergency rental assistance program that we did um, at the start of the pandemic when things were really uncertain for our neighbors with low incomes and how they were going to pay the rent. Um, right now is a particularly important time. We all know that high housing costs are just continuing to make it harder for people to move to Belmont as well as for people to stay here in this community. And the housing production plan will also, it's happening at a time where we are um, going to be putting new zoning into place under the state's new MBTA communities uh, zoning law. So it's nice to have these two things happening simultaneously because the housing production plan, we're showing what we need, we're showing the areas where we can see some development. And then through the new state law and work that we'll do in Belmont, um, we'll be able to potentially put align multifamily zoning with the areas that we highlight uh, for affordable housing production. Um, so the timing is great. I just want to thank you all for being a part of this. Um, before I turn it over to our amazing technical assistance providers, I just want to thank uh, the Housing Trust and Judy Fines in particular for all the work that she's been doing and, and Betsy Lipson on the housing production plan, Metro West Collaborative Development for having focus groups and really enriching the community engagement side of our housing production plan. And we couldn't do it without MAPC, who has just been tremendous partners on the housing production plan and also on, they're, they're with us through the MBTA community's uh, multifamily zoning work. Um, so with that being said, I will now turn it over to Courtney Lewis and uh, Sarah Scott, who will walk us through the housing production plan at this point. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Courtney Lewis. Uh, I'm a senior planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, MAPC. Um, I'm joined this evening with um, a few of my colleagues from MAPC as well, Sarah Scott, Christian Brandt, uh, Emma uh, Bagatella, uh, Bataglia um, via Zoom, uh, and I, it, it, tonight wouldn't be possible without uh, an amazing uh, amazing crew and, and, and colleagues. So I honestly thank them. Um, 
So I'm very pleased to be here uh, this evening to talk about the um, the housing production plan for Belmont. Uh, I welcome you to the third community forum for the HPP. Um, we started back, we had our first forum back in November. Uh, the, um, the Belmont Housing Trust held a second forum uh, in late January, and this is the third of uh, the public forums for the HPP. All right, so here's a quick look at our agenda for this evening. Uh, tonight is divided into two parts. Uh, we'll have uh, a presentation followed by Q&A. Um, we'll do an overview of the HPP process thus far and then uh, take questions. We'll discuss some next steps and then we will transition into the open house portion for this evening. So uh, I also wanna welcome those of you who are joining uh, via Zoom this evening. You will also have an opportunity to provide input and feedback on the draft goals and potential strategies for the HPP. If you have questions, please use the raise hand function and, um, and um, we'll acknowledge you. Uh, again, this is a partnership. Uh, in, uh, the town um, it, uh, has entrusted MAPC to help guide this process. Uh, we have been working in partnership with both the Housing Trust and uh, Metro West um, throughout, the, throughout the plan. And uh, as Rachel noted, uh, each, each uh, team member has brought something uh, valuable to the process. So definitely appreciate um, those who have been involved. We, we've also been supported and guided by the HPP subcommittee uh, who have uh, provided time and thought and, and um, insight into the process and the development of uh, the draft goals and strategies. Uh, this, this is just reiterating uh, that there's been a series of uh, opportunities for uh, engagement and um, working collaboratively uh, we've been able to uh, engage the, the public in various ways, which I'll talk a little bit about once we get into the overall process. So uh, I'm gonna start off just talking about the HVP, what it is. Um, uh, I'm sure if many of you joined earlier, uh, uh, well, last year, the end of last year in November, my colleague um, Lydia uh, walked you through what an HPP is. So this will be a brief refresher. Uh, essentially, a HPP is a guiding tool for communities uh, in helping them identify and address housing challenges and also create a roadmap for uh, how to address those challenges and meet uh, the needs of uh, the their community as it pertains to housing and housing development. So um, the requirements for HPP are defined in state law, chapter 40B. Uh, it encourages communities to expand their uh, affordable housing stock. Um, if a town is, um, if a town is below the 10% affordable housing, um, then uh, local zoning can be um, can be approved by the the local ZBA. Uh, if a town is um, is below the, their ten percent threshold, but have a certified HPP, then they are granted what's uh, considered safe harbor, um, which protects communities from unwanted uh, uh, development. Um, uh, 
Uh, so again, uh, the components of uh, the forty, um, the components of an HPP are defined in in Chapter Forty B. Um, those components include a housing needs uh, and demand assessment, which um, Lydia shared uh, a lot of information and a, and a lot of content in the first forum. Uh, it also includes and requires the community to develop goals to help guide uh, the future vision uh, for housing in that community. Um, we are required to do an analysis of development constraints, uh, both uh, in environmental as well as uh, zoning and regulatory uh, constraints and barriers. Um, we're required to identify potential development sites throughout the community and also create strategies that support uh, the, the development of, uh, of, of housing based on the, on the goals that have been uh, developed throughout the process. Uh, and finally, um, the community is required to set uh, targets for future production of housing. So very briefly, I'm going to go through some um, some definitions. Um, again, this information was shared in in the previous forum, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, the first word is um, the first term is area medium income or AMI, uh, and this is um, this is the median uh, income for a geographic region that's determined by HUD. Um, and the AMI for Greater, Greater Boston, which includes Belmont, is 140,200. 140, I think this was, a, this was a quiz in the uh, first forum, but the, uh, the answer is 140,000. Uh, affordable housing, so there are differences uh, in housing that, that is affordable and affordable housing. Um, housing that's reserved for households earning a certain uh, percentage of AMI um, at a cost that doesn't exceed 30% of their gross monthly income is considered um, affordable affordable housing, which is different from uh, housing that is deed restricted um, and, and in a sense set aside for, um, for low income, very low income and extremely in, um, low income households. Um, th these are divided into three different brackets based on certain percentage points uh, of the a of the AMI. Uh, subsidized housing inventory or or S SHI is an inventory that's maintained uh, by um, the Department of Housing and Community Development for the state um, DHCD uh, and it includes all affordable housing units uh, um, in, in communities, and it also uh, keeps track of, of whether uh, a community is meeting that their 10% target. Cost burden. Uh, a household is considered to be cost burden when they pay more than 30% of their to total monthly income on housing. Uh, this includes utilities, um, and uh, a, house, a household that is severely cost burden uh, pays more than 50% of income uh, on housing costs. Next slide. Again, it was a, a pop quiz from before. So looking at ways that uh, um, the HPP can help Belmont, um, as I said, it can help, uh, having a certified plan can help the community meet its uh, housing needs. 
it addresses unmet housing needs and identifies um, uh, certain uh, certain areas and, and demographics within a community that may be struggling with um, with being able to find housing or um, again be um, cost burden um, by having an HPP in uh, a, a certified HPP it uh, the community is able to more proactively influence future development uh, in their community uh, it also helps um, with coordination, um, both uh, internal and external. So there are often uh, these series of plans that are um, that and, and planning efforts that take place in a community, but uh, they don't always uh, connect or they don't always um, align. And so ensuring that um, everyone is sitting at the same table and working towards a shared goal is, is another benefit of having uh, this plan in place. Again, um, I mentioned that uh, by having a plan, it lays out a clear um, vision uh, and a stated um, um, it lays out a clear vision and um, makes a statement that the community is, is uh, actively working towards meeting their 10%. Um, it also helps uh, other, other people in the community who may not be cost burden or may not be um, facing some of the same challenges as their neighbor better understand um, the issues, the what's and why's, and and how they can um, how they can help or support uh, the process as well. Um, so, as I mentioned uh, previously, the um, the HPP um, is a process that it um, that is closely aligned with another planning effort that's currently underway, which is Section 3A. Uh, and I am now going to hand things off uh, briefly to my colleague, Sarah, who is go going to talk about 3A and the town's efforts to comply with, with Section 3A. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Scott. I'm a regional land use planner with MAPC. Uh, I will try to heed the, uh, the brief part of the briefing. Um, so as Courtney mentioned, I am one of the MAPC staff who's working on the concurrent project to develop uh, multifamily unit uh, housing um, that would be allowed through this new 3A zoning. So um, I just put together a few slides to explain what 3A is, what the process is, how we're doing that in Belmont, and how that builds off of the HBP. So 3A uh, is probably a term that some of you have heard. You may have heard it called MBTA communities. The actual legislation is very long and has lots of numbers in it. Um, but basically, it's state legislation that requires municipalities that are served by the MBTA transit system to have zoning in place that allows for multifamily housing by right. And they define multifamily as meaning three or more units within the structure, and then by right, meaning that no special permit or variance is required for the development to take place. There are a lot of guidelines that the state has issued around how these communities can meet 3A. There are a few main ones that I wanted to mention tonight. Um, one is this idea of minimum unit density. So in addition to having those, uh, those units be multifamily, um, we're also looking to meet a certain number of units across the entire zoning district. We are also looking to have a district that meets the minimum district size requirements in terms of the land area, the acreage. And then we're also looking to locate the district in areas that achieve these smart growth 
goals in terms of having housing near transit rich areas. So in Belmont, that would mean Waverly and Belmont Center in particular with access to the commuter rail, but then also looking at areas where there's access to, for example, frequent bus routes. Um, the way that the state has kind of rolled out the requirements is that based on what type of transit different communities have is when they need to have this zoning in place. So for Belmont, that means having the zoning in place by the end of 2024. So we are at the very beginning of this process, which is great because then that way we really can align with the goals and the strategies that are laid out in the HPP. So one of the um, main things that I wanted to say just about our project is that we are trying to define a town-wide vision. So the goals that are outlined in the HPP are really important because we want to build off of that foundation through the 3A work. It's really, it's not just about trying to, to comply, right? It's, it's about kind of that broader purpose and, and the broader goals. Um, and those community goals will be identified through the HPP and Courtney has a whole presentation on those and you'll have an opportunity to weigh in on those today. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're expanding housing opportunity in the way that we, um, we craft the zoning standards. One other thing I wanted to mention about 3A, which I think is important because it's a little bit different than the context for the housing production plans, is that it's not a requirement to produce housing units. Ideally, housing would be produced as a result of this zoning, but the production of housing is not what ensures compliance. Compliance means that you have the zoning in place that would allow that housing to be produced. So it's, it's a bit of a nuanced difference between the 3A requirements and the 40B and the housing production plan requirements. So the process for our project, like I said, is starting by building off of the housing production plan. We're going to be doing a little bit more analysis in terms of understanding some of these key areas of town. Um, and then we're also going to be digging a little bit deeper into the zoning to try to understand what the existing zoning districts and zoning standards are to see what we can build off of and, um, and what we can expand. Um, one of the ways in which our project will be a little bit different from the HPP is that we will be drafting zoning language and we will be working with the town to have that language be adopted. Um, so it's, it's kind of like one way that the housing production plan will be implemented. The 3A project is not necessarily going to implement 100% of the plan, but we're hoping that we can kind of meet 100% of its spirit by implementing this, this one aspect. Um, like I said, the goal of the project is adopting the zoning. It's not just having a plan, it's making sure that the zoning is in place. And uh, MAPC is working very closely with the town, including Gabe standing in the back, as well as uh, an incredible advisory committee that's been appointed by, um, by the town. And that includes folks from a variety of boards and commissions, including Rachel from the Housing Trust, folks from the Planning Board and the Historical Commission, to really make sure that we have a diverse set of experiences. In terms of the timeline, like I said, we're really just getting started with some of that background research, understanding the context in Belmont. We are uh, planning on doing some more public facing work, some community visioning in the late spring, hopefully like May, June before folks clear out for the summer. And then we'll be spending our summer doing some more of that technical analysis to understand compliance, kind of crunching all the different numbers. And then we'll be coming back out to the community in the fall to share some of these draft recommendations that have been developed in consultation with the town and the advisory committee. And then from there, we will write the zoning and have a third public forum, hopefully sometime in the winter. And then uh, the following spring, spring of 2024, we'll work with the town to get the zoning adopted. So um, we'll be spending most of this year working on it uh, with a little bit more work at the beginning of next year. So that is the, uh, the gist of the 3A project. I think there might be some contact info at the end, but of course, if you have any questions or if you're interested in getting involved, you can feel free to reach out to Courtney if you can't find my contact info or reach out to Gabe from, uh, from the town side. So I will leave it at that, but happy to answer questions when we get to the question section at the end. Thanks everyone.
All right. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, walk us through the uh, process and um, some major phases of work uh, through the HPP. So uh, as I said, we really started uh, this process late summer, early fall. We started with a tour. We, could, we, we kicked things off with doing a tour of Belmont to better understand and get a better sense of the, the community context. Um, and, um, and then we started our data collection and analysis uh, again, Lydia shared a lot of that information with you in, in that first forum for the housing needs assessment, uh, which was in uh, the, that first forum was in November. Uh, uh, during, that, um, during that time, the um, Metro West held a series of focus groups with different, uh, different groups throughout the community to better understand and assess the uh, community needs uh, as it relates to housing. Um, and following the, uh, the first forum, there was an online survey which uh, asked residents and participants to weigh in on uh, the, the goals from the previous HPP and also provide thoughts, ideas uh, on uh, future goals, and I'll share some of that um, some of that feedback and information uh, with you uh, this evening. Um, as I mentioned, the Belmont Housing Trust held a uh, a second forum in Jan in late uh, late January, uh, and part of um, part of the exercises for that. Uh, looked at housing locations and uh, typologies. Uh, they did a series of mapping exercises that asked residents uh, where could they see future development taking place in the community and um, what type of development, like what that development looked like, the scale, the density, the, um, the architectural detailing. And uh, we'll do a similar um, uh, exercise as, as a part of refining that process uh, this evening, both in person and uh, online. You'll also have an opportunity to uh, inspect some of the uh, opportunity sites that have been identified and also uh, offer ideas on uh, other, other locations that should be uh, considered. Um, also in winter, we did a, can you go back just for a second? <laughs> uh, also in winter, we did a, um, a development constraint, development constraints analysis that looked at the, the town zoning bylaw, as well as um, uh, uh, physical and environmental factors that weigh into uh, um, that weigh into decisions of selecting appropriate sites for future development, um, and uh, during the spring, uh, the uh, internal uh, core team started to work on draft goals uh, based on feedback from both the first forum and the community survey as well as the second uh, community forum. And uh, that is what we will be presenting this evening. Um, we invite you to provide um, input on, on these goals. Again, these are draft goals and potential strategies. Nothing has been finalized as of yet. And there, there, um, there will be further refine, refining uh, of some of these uh, presented goals. So looking at, at points of engagement and, and engagement by the number, um, as I mentioned, the, there have been two public forums so far. The, tonight makes the third. Uh, 
there were four uh, focus groups held with uh, different groups throughout the community. Um, there have been, um, in terms of attendance for and participation in person for some of those, uh, both in person and hybrid, um, at least for the first forum, um, there were uh, 55 participants. Um, and in terms of survey responses, um, there were at least 558 uh, respondents. Uh, that number does not necessarily mean that um, each individual answered every question or completed uh, the survey. However, uh, that number of, of respondents engaged at some point with the survey. Um, we, we worked through multiple channels in order to get the word out about uh, these events, both through word of mouth, uh, through posting physical and digital flyers, um, doing email blasts and advertising both on the project website, which is hosted by MAPC, as well as the town, uh, the town's uh, webpage, and also um, posting events through social media. Uh, we've also we also worked with the Belmont Media Center to ensure that uh, the events were live streamed, and even if people couldn't be attend or participate in person, that they could view at uh, view the content at some point. Uh, as I mentioned, Metro West uh, uh, held four focus groups. Uh, they uh, did. Um, they had discussions with seniors, uh, families, families with school age children, uh, people who were concerned with environmental issues in the community, and uh, also people who uh, were struggling with the cost of housing. Some of the themes that came up in uh, the write-up and the analysis of uh, those groups were um, people wanted uh, larger unit sizes for seniors. Um, um, the the um, quality and sustainable design was also uh, a theme uh, throughout some of the discussions, as well as uh, ha the town having a good mix of different housing types um, that that would suit um, residents through their full life cycles. Uh, shifting over to the survey responses, um, 541 people um, which account for approximately 2.8% of Belmont uh, adults access the survey. Um, the average response rate was uh, um, approximately 300. Um, um, some of the housing priorities that, um, that came through uh, the survey included um, um, a high priority for, for uh, survey respondents was the overall uh, housing costs burden, um, the amount of affordable housing uh, or lack of affordable housing uh, in the town, um, looking at the local uh, gap in affordability and the increase in school enrollment. Um, uh, these were some of the key takeaways uh, and some of the data points that Lydia shared in the first forum. Um, some, of the, um, some of the other themes that, and priorities that, didn't, that weren't necessarily high priorities but were stated throughout the survey included um, barriers, uh, Barriers that um, that were in place uh, due to uh, zoning regulations and permitting processes, um, a lack of uh, a variety of smaller housing types, 
um, a lack of density near uh, transit uh, areas and transit nodes and um, sustainability as well as um, aging households looking to look looking to downsize uh, in terms of housing goals um, as I mentioned um, respondents survey respondents were asked to review the the, um, the previous plans goals and weigh in in terms of uh, their relevance uh, today and um, based on the survey results 49 percent of respondents felt that seniors were still a housing for seniors was still a uh, a high priority um, housing for new families and um, providing housing for low income um, households was also noted as a priority some of the new housing goals that were posed um, for consideration were uh, housing located closer to transit and, and near transit uh, options, housing for seniors looking to downsize, <clears throat> having a variety of different types of smaller houses, including cottages, um, townhomes, and ADUs. Um, or accessory dwelling units, um, and also increasing housing opportunity, both access to housing and affordability for um, diverse ethnic and racial uh, groups. So uh, I talked a little bit about this. Uh, this was the exercise that was conducted uh, in the second public forum held in, um, in January, uh, where residents were, or participants were asked to weigh in in a number of sites that have been identified as potential opportunity sites throughout the community, uh, as well as uh, the types of housing that could potentially be um, constructed on, on some of these sites. <coughs> Um, I think there is a slight error in the labeling of, of this site. I apologize for that. This should have the site locations, not the housing types, uh, which the next slide uh, has. So these were some of the images and housing types in terms of density um, and um, that were presented. Uh, and and participants were asked to respond to. And again, uh, great feedback was gathered and that, that input uh, and those sites, um, the, um, the recommendations or, uh, for those sites were considered uh, when determining uh, the opportunity sites that we'll share uh, this evening. Uh, so MAPC uh, also did a site suitability analysis, which took a more uh, calculated and quantitative approach to um, to looking at sites through, throughout the town that might be suitable for future development. Um, there were <clears throat> there was one composite score, um, and there were six different. Uh, criteria that fed into uh, the calculation of that score. <coughs> and um, those, those things were determined by a series of 20 other um, things like walkability, uh, rights of way, um, um, unique or endangered or critical, uh, critical landscapes, um, um, flood hazard areas, all those things went into um, calculating and uh, coming up with uh, a score, a score, and essentially each parcel within the town was uh, received a score and um, 
that kind of determine or help guide um it gave us a conversation point or a starting point to at um places to look for potential uh sites for development and that is what is represented in this map here uh so the the sites that are highlighted in the darkest shade of pinkish red or rose are considered sites that are um, um, less suitable for, for future development. And those areas that are highlighted in the darker green are the sites that were most suitable for development. Uh, this, is, this was simply an analysis exercise. It didn't necessarily mean that these sites are the sites that that could or should be developed. Um, again, uh, this is just what kind of came out of taking all those factors into consideration. Uh, and the, the, uh, some of these sites were reviewed with members of the subcommittee and the core, the core team to get uh, additional thought and insight on uh, some of the sites. Uh, because like I said, just because a, a particular site scored high didn't mean that it was necessarily uh, appropriate for uh, development. Um, in terms of um, kind of taking a, a qualitative look uh, outside of um, some of that uh, quantitative analysis, uh, there are certain elements of uh, <clears throat> that should be thought about and considered when making decisions about uh, citing future ho future housing development. Um, this um, framework is from AARP, which uh, looks at seven different livability factors, ranging from housing, uh, the um, uh, the the health and vitality of the neighborhood itself, um, how uh, transportation connections, uh, walkability, uh, health, the health um, and health access to not only services, but parks, open spaces, um, and recreation facilities, uh, opportunities for uh, economic, by um, economic development and um, wealth generation. Uh, so lo also looking at uh, educational opportunities and access to jobs. Um, and also just community and, and engagement and involvement, both uh, from a social standpoint uh, and a civic and um, a civic and, and planning standpoint. So um how do people view your community and how do do people in belmont feel like they're part of the community um so i thought it was appropriate to highlight uh some of these things to take into consideration when looking at various sites uh, and trying to determine um, opportunities for development uh, and again, AARP defines liv uh, a livable community as one that is safe and secure, has affordable and appropriate housing and transportation options, and offers supportive community features and services. Uh, once in place, those resources enhance personal independence, allow residents to age in place, and foster residents' engagement in community sick community in the community's civic, economic, and social life. So um, now, that, now that we've looked at sites, we've talked about the good, the bad, the ugly, um, let's look at solutions. Let's look at um, ways that we start to address some of the, uh, some of the housing challenges. So um, just very quickly, um, noting that um, 
this this graphic just helps explain how our approach to um, developing goals and strategies and then actions for this plan. So a goal is broad and aspirational. Um, there's not a, a huge amount of details, but it it points uh, individuals in the right direction. Uh, uh, strategies uh, talk about the uh, they talk about how to go about achieving those goals, um, what resources, uh, what individuals, what um, what policies need to be in place to help support uh, the achievement of, of set goal. And then finally, drilling down to specific actions. So um, there, are, there are often a series of strategies that have to be executed a series of strategies and actions that have to be executed in order to achieve the overall goal. And so just looking at, um, for instance, if um, I think one of the things that uh, has come up often in discussion in discussions is the um, is lowering the minimum lot size requirement for certain zoning districts in, in an area. Well, that doesn't happen you know, overnight. There's a series of steps that have to be taken in order to uh, bring about overall change. And so just highlighting and noting that um, if some of these goals seem a little vague or less defined, we're happy to, to workshop some of these things. But again, goals are intended to be pretty broad and um, then we drill down from there. Next slide. So for this plan, uh, the uh, project team has, has developed five draft goals for your consideration. Uh, and we'd love to hear feedback on, on these. Goal one, create additional affordable housing opportunities for seniors, families, and Belmont's local workforce. Uh, this. Uh, all three demographics uh, were highlighted uh, both in, sur in the survey and in the housing uh, needs analysis. Um, seniors and, and youth um, saw a great increase in, in terms of population growth. Um, there was also uh, there were also s several statements about workforce and the um, the amount of um, the the median income that is needed in order to uh, in order to own rent uh, own or rent a home here in in Belmont without that household being cost burden. Goal two is expand uh, is preserve expand and create deed restricted affordable housing for low income low income households and again um, this goal differs from goal one being that it is um, deed restricted affordable housing and uh, any units um, generated or are are developed specifically um, for low income households that were deed restricted would also count towards the the town's overall uh, SH, SHI. Uh, goal three, support and invest in programs and policies that address racial disparities in housing access and affordability. Uh, another de uh, interesting demographic uh, that came up in the housing need assessments is the, the town's modest growth in uh, its Asian population um, noting that the the town is becoming slightly more slightly more diverse, uh, and so one of the things that we um, through discussion we thought was important to address and to note um, was to ensure it, was to ensure that um, uh, minorities and low income households had an opportunity to live, um, work, and enjoy 
um, their community as well. Um, goal four, promote net zero housing construction and carbon neutrality. Um, as, as I noted from some of the focus group uh, themes and some of the uh, themes that came up in the survey, um, people are um, concerned about, uh, they want housing, they want development, but they also want the, want, uh, the town and developers to take a responsible and sustainable approach to new housing development. Uh, and these things are further supported by other plans that the town has in place. They're recently completed um, hazard mitigation and um, municipal vulnerability plan. Um, and just jumping, uh, well, I'll, I'll hold that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, goal five, uh, promote promote the development of walkable and bikeable 15 minute neighborhoods. Um, so this is also something that supports things like um, 3A uh, and also just building healthy and, and stronger um, communities overall. Um, and so a 15 minute community basically aims to ensure that a person has access to uh, vital um, vital um, resources and um, services and amenities that they need uh, in their day-to-day -day life uh, within a 15-minute walk, bike, or transit uh, access point from their, from their home. So um, this, this goal would achieve uh, an overlap um, with, with furthering other efforts and initiatives throughout the town. So shifting to strategies. So I, I also want to note that these are, these are just potential strategies um, and that um, each strategy could uh, address multiple goals um, moving forward. So strategy one, uh, hold a placemaking work, hold placemaking workshops for residents to engage in planning specific sites identified as opportunity sites uh, uh, in the plan. Uh, strategy two, host quarterly engagement and education events on housing needs and opportunities in Belmont. Um, this includes things like holding meetings with town officials. Um, and also working with diverse groups and uh, segments of the community. Uh, strategy three, aim to spend more than 10% annual uh, than, um, than the 10% the annual minimum of community preservation funding on community housing. Uh, Rachel noted, um, the the event the um, the strides that the town has made um, in in housing in its housing efforts uh, due to CPA fund funding, so uh, one of the thoughts was why not why why not push beyond what's required? Um, strategy five: <clears throat> apply for housing choice community designation from DHCD and for a planning for housing production grant through, ma through mass housing. <clears throat> Again, uh, taking advantage and leveraging grant funding in order to um, advance uh, housing goals uh, uh, laid out in the plan. Um, what's the thought behind that, that strategy? Uh, strategy six, update the town's comprehensive plan uh, incorporating this HPP into the housing element. So um, again, just uh, ensuring that um, current and future coordination is is taking um, is acknowledging and taking advantage of all the hard work and all of the um, investment that has already been made in uh, in this plan, and making sure that they uh, support. Uh, that the plans support each other uh, and, and not cause c conflict. 
uh, strategy seven, renovate um, Belmont Housing Authority properties, including uh, addressing a lack of accessibility. <clears throat> so um, uh, I, I also think it was stated that uh, there are two housing authority properties that are um, that are either currently being renovated or renovations are underway and improving those properties, not only for um, individuals who um, who may be considered um, uh, ensuring that as renovations and improvements are made, you're also addressing uh, accept accessibility issues for people and residents who um, live in those um, in in those places in those communities <clears throat> uh, strategy eight obtain a di additional tenant based voucher funding and dedicate it to project based units making ex existing housing units permanent permanently affordable. <clears throat> Strategy nine, leverage redevelopment of property owned by religious institutions. Um, there were several discussions about um, properties throughout the town that are either currently up for sale or um, um, are looking to be sold in the future and um, allowing the town to position itself to take advantage of some of those uh, locations for, uh, for housing. Uh, investigate development opportunities on large vacant sites um, in the same way um, as noted. So that uh, the whole um, analysis process in, in looking at suitable sites <clears throat> was just like a, a first exercise in um, in investigating um, future sites for future development. Allowing two family homes by right in general uh, in the general residence and single residence zoning district. Again, um, having lowering the um, minimum lot sizes and allowing uses by right versus uh, having people have to uh, obtain a special permit. Um, maximize affordable housing opportunity uh, with new development that occurs in the 3A, in, in 3A zoning. So again, planning for fut uh, future, um, um, future zoning. Um, Allow greater uh, density and transit accessible development areas, in particular, um, to meet <laughs> to meet the goals and requirements. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To meet the requirements of uh, the MBTA uh, Communities Act, um, and finally, Strategy 14 reduce parking requirements uh, where there are opportunities to expand or create new affordable housing. So uh, those are the 14 strategies and the five goals that um, have been uh, developed thus far. And, and again, we welcome uh, your feedback, your thought and input on some of those, uh, on those um, goals and strategies. So now I'm going to stop talking and take a sip of water. <laughs> um, and I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Um, my colleague Christian is going to help facilitate that. But I think with, given the, the group size, it, I think we're good. Um, also, Emma is going to be looking for questions in the chat on Zoom. And I welcome um, members of the project team, the town, uh, um, to, to chime in in terms of uh, responding to or addressing questions. So I'll open it up now. <coughs> <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah. I was wondering if you could expand on the strategy of leveraging redevelopment of property owned by religious institutions. How does that work if they're not, like, do they have to be on board with that, or how does that work? Um, yes, of, uh, any, any private sites would definitely have to be on board with, um, with the selling specific properties. Um, but there are some, um, depending on context and history, um, there may be opportunities to, um, you know, there may be portions of the property or a surplus that uh, either they can't or just don't want to maintain or support further. And so that, that provides an opportunity, um, especially when you're dealing with like more of like an institution versus like a private developer. When you took up the surveys in the other communities, were the responses about the same as in Belmont? How did Belmont uh, fare in responses and people interested? Mm. I, I can't say with certainty, but I, what I will say is I, I believe the response rate of the town was, was fairly good uh, given um, Given the, given the subject matter, which can be very, very technical at times, and also given that people's attention span sometimes, they, uh, you know, if you can get someone to complete a survey, I think it's, it's always great. Uh, we do the best that we can to limit the amount of questions and the amount of, the amount of content we throw at people. But uh, considering, now, I, uh, are there other segments of the community that uh, that need um, enhanced engagement? Certainly, and I think that was thought about in in terms of how we um, other and, and how we laid out other engagement points. So, doing smaller, more intimate focus groups, dealing with. Uh, a specific subset of, gr of, of groups who have differing uh, issues or concerns, I think, w was a way to try and reach lar broader segments of the community. <clears throat> I can speak to that a little bit. I don't even know if, oh, this is on. I can speak to that a little bit, just more context. My name's Christian Brandt. I'm the interim community engagement director at MAPC. So I have a little bit of information about other surveys that we've done, not necessarily about housing. And um, I would say that generally we get between 500 and 700 survey participants. So it's pretty par for the course when it comes to how people participate in surveys. But like Courtney said, the engagement staff person who's on this project, Najee Nunnally, he couldn't be here today. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, uh, was working with the project team to just identify other ways that people can engage besides surveys because we know that surveys are not everyone's favorite thing to do. So. Uh, I also want to be mindful of, I think we have a few questions in the chat, too, so um, Emma, feel free to. I'm wondering uh, if you did a complete review of the zoning laws. My understanding is that Belmont zoning laws are a disaster, um, and uh, a lot of the communities around here have zoning laws that that are more modern and appropriate for the housing they actually have. And that Belmont, I believe in Belmont, 80% of the units, uh, existing units, are do not meet what the zoning, I forget what the word is. Non-conforming, thank you. They're non-conforming. And I wonder the extent to which the strategies that we've talked about uh, deal with those issues. So there was a full zoning audit done of the, the town's bylaws, and um, that was completed by my colleague, Alex Koppelman. 
He also put together a memo of recommend uh, recommended uh, recommendations that will be incorporated into the into the plan as well. Um, one also being, as I mentioned, as uh, I. I've mentioned and others have mentioned the um, the changes in the minimum lot size requirements, which cause uh, certain lots to to be nonconforming. I can also add. Um, I want to just let um, some of the folks on the chat weigh in. Um, so first, we have a question from Pam A. Um, she said that she's heard that development above commercial properties has been discussed. Has there been any interest in this opportunity on the part of existing commercial property owners? Uh, so yes. So in one of the um, exercises that was that the core team did, um, we looked one. Uh, we looked at sites along. Um, we looked at. Uh, Star Market, as an example of looking at uh, opportunities to add height above existing structures, and also Trape um, the Trapello Road corridor was also also came up in discussions in terms of um, adding stories above existing structures. And and both of those sites have been are are listed and have been identified on. Um, uh, on the opportunities map. Great. Um, oh, I, can, yeah. I, I think Rachel. Yeah, I think can I go Rachel. Back and forth? I think Rachel wanted to add some further context. Yes. Um, touching on Helen's question as well. Um, you know, most of our, a lot of our community does have two and three families, but they can no longer be built under the current zoning law. There's, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. You walk around your neighborhood, you think all of these homes are, you know, could, could be redone. Um, it certainly came up in the housing production plan, both uh, the, the comment about two families um, making it allowed by right, also the 3A or multifamily <laughs> zoning. And this has also come up in the MBTA Communities Advisory Committee um, as we're thinking about not just transit, but also commercial areas, more of that 15-minute neighborhood uh, that Courtney was talking about. So using zoning to further multiple goals on affordability, economic development. So I think it's happening in a few places. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Emma. Um, OK, Heather Brenhaus asked, have there been many questions specific to Section 3A? And if so, was there any slash much pushback that signals possible issues for the town meeting vote next spring? I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure there have been, I have not been privy to, to some of those discussions, but I'm sure there have been uh, very intense conversations surrounding 3A. Oh, it is. It's working. Perfect. Thank you. Um, actually, I would say Belmont is um, doing something really unique around 3A. Um, so this MBTA Communities Advisory Committee is made up of multiple committees, which is really um, allowing us to talk about all of the things that are impacted by zoning. We're at the very beginning of the process, and not only is there the Housing Trust at the table and the Historic uh, Commission, but also the Economic Development Committee, the DEI Implementation Committee, the Planning Board, the Select Board, and it's we're being very thoughtful and very deliberate and um, are going to be opening up the process so people can really be a part of shaping what the future looks like. So we haven't had a lot of pushback yet. There's certainly questions, but I think this, real, this holistic approach is a really good way uh, for us to move forward because it's bringing in again all of these goals that we have around sustainability, walkability, economic development. So um, come to the, the meetings that are coming for that and be the positive voice. Yeah, I had a question about the goals. The first two goals talked about, they both talked about affordable housing. One mentioned deed restricted affordable housing, the other did not. Can you elaborate a bit on 
the distinction and kind of the thinking behind when you choose one over the other and what the implications are of that? Sure. So, um, um, affordable housing, um, which is also known as uh, naturally occurring affordable housing, is housing that is um, that 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 happens because of of, of um, current. <laughs> Um, I can, I can yes. speak about that a little bit. Well, um, do you, do you yeah. want to speak about that, Courtney? No, I was just going to say that uh, affordable, deep restricted, uh, uh, deep restricted affordable housing is very intentional in that this is housing that was specifically uh, created and, and, and produced to address a specific need um, versus uh affordable housing that's kind of driven by by the market uh and i, I welcome uh additional context uh and, sure um yeah. so i think the really key difference is the deed restriction and what that means in terms of long-term affordability because if a unit has a deed restriction on it a la the landlord can't just raise the rent um astronomically one year and then suddenly the person who's living in that unit can't afford to stay there so it basically um you know for income eligible people it there's requirements around you know how much the rent can go up and it makes sure that you know the goal is that that what you're what you're paying in rent isn't going to be more than 30 percent of your um your median income because or sorry of your income and i think that's also pretty crucial to note is that um there's a lot of naturally occurring affordable housing for a lot of reasons and there's a lot of like developers out there who out of their developers and property owners out of their own goodwill do price things below market but you know they could sell their building or an investor could buy their building like anything could really happen that could change the status of those units so that's kind of the the crucial part about deed restrictions but naturally occurring affordable housing is is in its own way is just as important as deed restricted it's just it, it fills a different role sort of could i add something uh the other thing to say is that sometimes when people talk about workforce housing they're talking about housing for households with incomes above that 80 percent of median limit for counting on the subsidized housing inventory, but yet meeting needs in the community. So it's something that in our housing production plan, we might say we need housing developed in that range, even though that's not affordable housing, capital A, capital H. Yeah, I'm um, Peter Gray, I saw you had your hand raised. Did you still have a question? Um, no, thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, the mic didn't stretch to where I went. So I wanted to introduce myself and pass something around. Um, and maybe somebody can create a counterpart in the chat. Um, but uh, at the last version of this, I sort of asked, uh, is there like an email list? Is there a group of people who are getting together to um, encourage this to happen? Because in response to another question, I don't know that there's been organized opposition, but if you read next door amidst the, the um, you know, lost cats and whatnot are also people, you know, upset already about the MBTA community's uh, stuff and, and um, you know, not uh, on board with these goals. I think that's actually probably a minority of people in Belmont, um, but people have to, you know, come out and sort of represent that these are the changes we want in the community, uh, sort of represented by these goals. So I'm going to pass around this email list, um, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Is the email list to join a group that you're starting to advocate for? The good yes. 
Uh, so, uh, Town of Warm Homes. Uh, so, our slogan is Town of Homes. To the town, so, Town of Warm Homes. Um, it's a Google group, and yeah. hopefully, uh, with your help, we'll become an actual group. Because there's a lot of bad information about the 3A stuff. I, I heard the other night, oh, yeah, 1,600 units we have to put up in Belmont. What's that about? Thank you. Um, I'm Renee Guo. I'm the planning board member, um, the liaison of the uh, housing protection plan. So I think some of the strategies are really concrete strategies that we can start implementing right now. But I feel like there are two things uh, missing. One is the stakeholders or the responsible parties who can actually uh, make those things happen. The second thing is um, we need funding sources. Because I know we can't, I mean, Belmont is we, we are a really dense community, but we are a small town government, so I don't think we have all the, the funds to realize some of those goals. So I feel like, you know, those are two critical things we need to figure out. Um, especially the first one, because, you know, we all know that Belmont runs on volunteers, and <laughs> a lot of the, the boards and, st and the committees and the, our staff are overworked, so I feel like it is critical to identify, you know, as many as possible stakeholders who can really support this process. Yes. Thank you. That is a really good point. Um, and I will note that we have already started to do that. There's there's a, uh, a larger matrix that's been developed that definitely identifies uh, both lead and supporting actors in some of these uh, strategies uh, and goals. Um, that, that just wasn't shared this evening uh, uh, as a way to not overwhelm, not, not throw too much at, but we welcome uh, suggestions, thoughts of uh, people, de people, departments, uh, organizations to consider uh, partnerships with moving forward. Um, I also want to note that um, someone in the chat wrote that they, that they want you to share your email uh, uh, in the Zoom as well. Sure. Uh, we have a walking map of the town, and it is set up all over town to show how far you can walk in five minutes. So uh, that does very helpful in terms of uh, setting up 15-minute communities because we already really have it all mapped out for the town. from the folks who are on Zoom or from folks in the room, we can adjourn to the boards and yeah. engage with the boards. Yeah, let me just explain what we're doing and, and how um, people on Zoom can also participate in uh, engaging with uh, the, the strategies. Um, so if you, um, as a follow-up to tonight's uh, Zoom recording, uh, Zoom session, you can also access a brief survey with questions that ask uh, your, um, 
the level of support you have for specific goals. We also ask for um, feedback on how to make these better or other things to, to consider. Uh, you can access that through the link that's currently on the screen or by scanning the, the QR code. Um, and that, that, um, that will be open for a few weeks. Um, so feel free to participate, encourage others to um, view the recording and, um, and provide input as well. And for those individuals that are here in person, uh, we have physical boards uh, around the room with the, the same um, goals and strategies posted. And we, we're asking that same question. Uh, um, please rate your, your level of support for a specific goal or strategy and also offer thoughts on ways that it could be improved or other actions that could be considered uh, as, we, as we move closer to um, producing a full draft of the HPP. Yes. You might want to mention the map there showing the opportunity sites. People might want to take a look at that while they're going around. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there is also a map that, which, again, uh, can be accessed through the survey. There's a link to the GIS. Uh, you don't have to have an account. Uh, it takes you straight to the, 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 um, the, the site, and you will see the same map that people here are, are viewing as well. Uh, and these are sites that have been identified either through the suitability analysis uh, or through, um, um, through previous engagement events. Uh, these are sites that have been identified both by members of the core team as well as residents in the community uh, for consideration. Um, uh, again, these are, these are just sites to consider that it does not mean that that anything is is being is going to be developed or built on a specific site, uh, so um, so yeah. Can we go play? <laughs> sure. Um, and 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 just before we 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 break, we are here. Oh, um, I will also note that uh, it, it looks like we're. We ran a little long with Q and A. Uh, it was only supposed to be 15 minutes, uh, but uh, Emma is available for a few minutes to answer any questions about the survey that you may run into, um, and she will stay online. and And again, myself and other members from MAPC are here to uh, to if you have questions as well. Um, just a few next steps. So as I mentioned, um, based on the feedback that we get tonight, both from the boards and online, we'll uh, take that and make um, revisions to, to the goals and, and strategies and then start to develop specific actions to address some of those things. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, have a full draft uh, ready for review um, very soon, uh, as Rachel mentioned, we're trying to ensure that we have uh, the town's updated plan in place before uh, the previous plan expires. And um, and again, just in, if you weren't able to uh, share the um, share the survey and provide input. All right, and that's it. So, uh, Emma, I'm going to, uh, I'll just note that our uh, contact information is uh, on the screen. You can also uh, get updates or check in on the progress of the project by visiting the project website, which is also listed on screen. Um, thank you all for joining and participating. So um, to give a little bit of context of why we are doing a little bit of business tonight, um, you may know that Belmont is part of the West Metro Home Consortium, uh, which is federal funding that goes through 
Newton, uh, which is the, the host of the consortium, and to several communities uh, you know, in the area. And these funds, home funds, are federal funds that can be used in a lot of great ways to create housing, to um, preserve housing, a lot of a lot of different housing uses. Uh, for many years, um, it was really handled largely, but very internally um, within uh, within um, the planning department. And now um, it's really opening up, and the housing trust is playing more of a role. Um, at this point. The, we're kind of at the end of this year's process where West Metro uh, Consortium has created an action plan that I sent out on uh, Friday and has recommendations for how to spend the funds. So we need to do two things tonight. One is discuss how Belmont can use these funds right now. Um, and two, to uh, vote on the actual plan. Um, the current recommendation, given that we're at the end of this process and there is something the Housing Trust is supportive of and, and uh, could use the funds and has been asking for the funds for a while, the Belmont Housing Authority um, for the redevelopment of Sherman Gardens uh, is one of, is really the, the main uh, place that, that the funding would go. We have up to, I believe we have up to two years worth of funding available. We're working with uh, our staff um, in town and with the West, West, West Metro Consortium to understand exactly how much funding is available at this time. But Gloria, do you want to describe a little bit of what uh, BHA, uh, sorry, yeah, what BHA is working on? We all we've all been involved with Sherman Gardens, but just give a sense of what how these funds would be used. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, the, the Belmont Housing Authority has been looking at the redevelopment of Sherman Gardens for many years. We received planning funds uh, from the uh, from, uh, community preservation grant from town meeting, uh, two different grants. We've received $173,000 for an initial uh, planning grant, and then we received additional $400,000 for pre-development costs. Uh, Matt uh, is a senior project manager with the Cambridge Housing Authority, and he's been the lead, uh, well, a person working with the BHA on this project. And I'd like to uh, ask Matt just to really describe uh, where we are right now with the B with the Sherman Gardens uh, redevelopment and how these funds would be used. And actually, I'm sorry, before Matt gets started, I didn't realize we also do have Madeline on, which is fantastic because Madeline is a home expert. Um, so let's turn it over to Matt. And then um, Madeline, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Go ahead, Matt. Hi everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Sajak with the Cambridge Housing Authority. Um, appreciate your time tonight. So the uh, Belmont Housing Authority has recently made some great progress on planning for the redevelopment of Sherman Gardens. Um, Cambridge Housing Authority as a financial consultant uh, has been working with the architectural firm BH Plus A over the last couple of months to develop a concept plan for the site which we presented to the BHA board and received a favorable reception. So uh, we're currently working on um, buttoning up that redevelopment plan. And then in the next couple of months, our hope is to move into the designer selection process and the commissioning of uh, schematic design plans with the goal of getting in front of the town land use board by the end of this year. So the financial support that the town is offering through CPA funds, as well as potentially through uh, home would help us to fund these sorts of soft costs. Uh, with respect to the home funds, there is a um, environmental review process that needs to be worked through with the West Metro Consortium and that I think would likely um, result in those funds coming in slightly later in the process. Um, but that is our, our goal to use the any home funds that the um, town is able to allocate to support pre-development costs of this uh, project. Um, happy to sort of describe the scope of the project if that's helpful. Um, let me know what detail could assist in decision making. Tommy has a question. Yes, Tommy. Um, Matt, what do you describe? What what do soft costs consist of? 
Sure. So um, soft costs are generally parts of the project that aren't construction. So a soft cost is something like architectural and engineering services, uh, an environmental study, surveying. Um, home has specific rules around what costs can be funded, and they look to generally fund um, either the sort of hard cost of construction or uh, these soft costs that are really clearly connected to the development of a affordable housing project. One other question. I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not knowledgeable. Home is a state program or a federal program? And what are the what's the acronym stand for? So um, HOME is the, I believe the full name is the Home Investment Partnership Program. And it's a, a federal program uh, where by funds are passed through to various jurisdictions um, based on formula funding. So uh, different uh, city or in some parts of the country governments or consortiums in this case, get an allocation each year and then the the funds are utilized for a variety of purposes one of which is um the creation of new construction affordable housing thank you madeline is there anything you would like to add about the home funds i know you're traveling right now it might be hard for you to uh no i don't I don't think so. I think um, the description of the program is is um, is accurate. Uh, it is one of the largest formula programs to uh, cities, um, and then there is certainly the state pass through funds, from which uh, we this consortium gets their funding. Um, they're just of note the. Cities that are larger than 50,000 in population are considered entitlement communities, so they get a direct allocation from the federal government. In our case, since we're smaller, we formed a consortium, and, um, and that, those consortia dollars are actually derived from the state allocation of home funds. So uh, that is a direct pass-through from, from the state allocation and a set aside for the consortium from the stake allocation. So that's just the detail in, in case people wonder why some cities get their own decision-making around the home use, fund use, and some are in a consortium. And some cities don't even belong to a consortium, but they apply for home funds from the state. So our, our situation is actually quite nice in that um, we are a member of this consortia that that can um, actually work together to describe um, what activities we wanna fund through the consortia home dollars. Okay, thank you, that was helpful. Was, I'm sorry, was there another question? Matt, were you about to say something? I, just one point that that, that reminded me of, of something that's important about home funds um, and it's important in relation to CPA too, is that it's a great signal to other funders of the commitment of local stakeholders to a project. So being able to pull in home funds to a project like Sherman Gardens will help us to um, work with other stakeholders, particularly DHCD, to um, assemble the rest of the funding needed for this project. So. Right on, Matt, that's actually a great segue to um, what I hope we're able to do you know, today we really need to take action on the current action plan and recommendations. Um, but I would love to work with Gabe and our town to really set up a process for the housing trust because it's about $50,000 a year that we could be putting out with the CPA funds, like Matt was saying, and really fostering, you know, more of the affordable housing development that we want to see. Um, so that is kind of the long-term plan. You know, for tonight, the proposals on the table are around Sherman Gardens, which would get the bulk of the funds. There's administrative fees as well. Uh, and then there's also a portion that is going into what the consortium is doing around fair housing testing, right? So that would be like Belmont's um, uh, portion of it, contribution, thank you. And um, you know, when Robert was here, he, he had filled us in on what they're trying to do with fair housing testing. So hopefully that can really move forward. Um, so we got our, tonight will be a little bit big on the, on the actual amount of money. 
Um, because as Matt said, we're trying to figure out if it's, I think Matt, if it's two years worth that can be used, right? Because they need to be used within the 12 months of um, the, the funds are dedicated. And so it's possible that we can use the FY23 and FY24 yes, for both um, uh, Sherman Gardens. But I think the, the way to probably um, to move something forward if, if, if we're ready to, and, and we certainly don't need to at this point, we can have more discussion, but is to, uh, we need to approve the action plan because they need the different communities to approve it. Um, and then to um, support that whatever funds are available outside of what we are contributing to the fair housing testing and administrative fee or administrative funding go to Sherman Gardens. Um, are there any questions, thoughts? Do people want to discuss it more? Were people able to look at the action plan? All I know is a big document to send on Friday. I didn't look at it, Rachel, but I do have a question. How, uh, just generally, how much money are we talking about? 50K a year. Yeah, generally about 50,000 a year. Yeah, yeah. Give or take. So a little bit more right now, right? It's like 59. 55, or oh, yeah. Over, over how many years? It's every, every year, essentially, right? Madeline, do you want to answer that? Yeah, that's right. Um, we, we are looking at um two years worth of and i don't have the sorry i don't have the action plan in front of me so i don't remember the exact amount in the neighborhood of um 50 000, as was mentioned and so this the allocation for this time around will be a little larger because we have the two years worth which is actually quite nice in terms of um covering some of the soft costs and, and being ready for some of the soft costs as we were talking about um, but in subsequent years, it will um, we will be deciding on the use based on that kind of yearly allocation of approximately fifty thousand a year. Yeah, and, and oh, Madeline, I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Judy. Yeah. So, so you know, when I first started seeing these numbers, we were putting the first one year's worth to. Yeah. Sherman Gardens, and now we're talking about automatically using the second year for that. And I just want us to stop and think a minute whether we have, we want to use that second and then the following years for our fund, or are we sure we want to put it to Sherman Gardens now? Yeah, and um, here's what I would say, I don't know if Corey wants to jump in. Um, the funds really need to be committed, correct, within, and Madeline can answer this, within 12 months. I'm not certain that we will have something to commit to as possible. So it's not just putting out the RFP, it would be actually having a project to commit to. I believe yeah, that's, that's the case. History. Madeline, can you answer that question? Madeline, are you there? Sorry, what was the question? So the second year that's pending in front of us right now, if we wanted to use it to add to our CPA pot, and put it out to an RFP. Putting it out doesn't commit it su sufficiently to meet the deadline. We'd have to actually have a process, you know, have a grant in place and something happening to a project. Now, he, I think um, if you're if you've obligated the funds, then a new timeline sets for um, for expenditure. There's a well, they they made some changes. It used to be a 24 month expenditure deadline and I think those have been suspended due to COVID. I have to check, I have to double check to see if um, they're back to the 24. Matt, do you know? But obligating doesn't mean putting it out as an RFP. Obligating means setting a project in motion. Right. You're okay. you're putting you're putting the dollars towards a specific activity. So then I, I can see why it's risky to assume that we would have another right, specific activity yeah. to meet the deadline, right? We might not. And once we get ourselves set up so that we're in the regular, you know, in a regular cycle of putting out RFPs, I think we'll be much better, not RFPs, as notice of funding availability, um, I think we'll be more prepared uh, to be able to put that money out as well. Um, Matt, were you going to say something about the home funds? I think your microphone came on. I was just going to agree uh, with uh, sort of the timeline, understanding that there's a uh, I believe it's a year to get the funds committed and then you have a longer period which i do think is still longer than 24 months to actually spend down the funds yeah i haven't seen any um any reversion back to the 24 month commitment period so 
Um, but I'll double check. I'll dig a little deeper on that. Thank you, Alan. Want me to? So yes, the, we still appreciate that. that. Sorry, Rachel, the part that I'm still a little, um, I'm taking minutes. So I'm just trying to figure out the 50,000 gets committed every year. And then I've heard every year, just kind of like, and is this typical like Madeline, you know, there's like a five-year um, consolidated plan. Is that related to that action plan? So is it a five-year cycle or are we- Yeah, saying- it's a five-year cycle. What happens is that you have a consolidated plan that covers five years. Every year you have to do an annual action plan. In that annual action plan, you um, kind of review what your activities are for that year. If there, you know, there's an understanding that in five years things can change. So if you need to change the um, activities within that five-year period, you you reflect that in the um, annual action plan. Um, now. The, and the consolidated plan should have expenditure buckets basically that are broad enough so you have some wiggle room in terms of um, in terms of how to allocate those dollars. If for whatever reason you decide that there's this really new impactful project in the course of the five years that doesn't fit into the funding buckets that you decided at the beginning, then that would necessitate a substantial amendment, which means that <clears throat> you submit and you go through a substantial amendment process with public comment periods to amend the the consolidated action plan, um, essentially. So I think you know I think we're we're within we're well within the bounds of what the consolidated plan states for the use. Um, the allocations are consistent, um, generally consistent. Um, throughout the the years um, in the five year period, um, and so each year you could you could basically um, you could basically trust that you're going to get a similar amount of money and that you're going to use it for the 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 bucket that you decided on at the beginning and the five in the consolidated plan. Okay, and then just to follow up, and Gloria, I know you have another you have your hand up. But just to follow up, um, Madeline um, and folks involved, maybe Matt, you know, so is this year two? And so it would be 50,000 for like year two, year three, year four, year five. And then we're back to the consolidated plan. Yes. Okay. Each year you get the same, you get an allocation. But I think, and the, the group can correct me if I'm wrong, that the intent tonight is only to allocate Sherman Garden for, for two of those years. And yes. then the hope would be for future years, you have your, your NOFA process going. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we're and hoping that's that FY23 and FY24, Matt, I know you said you're waiting for environmental reviews and figuring out how to make the timelines work, but that is what we're what we're committing to at this point, um, or, or what we're putting on the table. Gloria, you had your yeah. hand raised? Yes, it was just to confirm that we were looking for the, the past two years in a sense. There's, I'm not really sure when that new year starts, but it seems like there's another 50 that's, that's um, that this, the trust could actually, it doesn't need to commit to yet. I think we're looking at, we don't want to lose these funds and we need to commit to a project now or risk some of that, one of those $50,000 going into the general pot of money yeah. Yeah. and the pool. And I think that we're just saying that the Sherman Gardens could make use of that, the, the last two years of home funds. And then the third year that's coming up, I, under, I believe, um, could be used by whatever, in whatever way the trust uh, determines. Yeah. And just commenting, I'm Gloria, I'm glad you brought up the pool. So any funds that aren't spent or committed by each of the communities goes into this pool. Um, it's possible Sherman Gardens could apply to the pool as well, right? And and be able to get more funds. Um, but it's it's all the funds that weren't spent. But then, you know, we- For we, the region. Right. For the region, there could be developments that we propose um, go apply for that as well as get our allocation. Gloria, is that how um, we used it before? You know, um, <laughs> Judy, where, uh, when uh, um, Waverly uh, Woods was, Woods built, was yeah. built, was it through the pool? Was it a yeah. Okay, so. But it was, yeah, I think, I think Jeffrey, no, I was going to say Jeffrey handled whatever the yeah. paperwork was behind it okay. so that it seemed pretty yeah. easy. We were getting 100000 a year wow. at that point, which is really nice. And we got 
three or maybe four years worth of that money wow. to, to go to, into Waverly Woods. So yes, we, we, we have had a history of doing some really great stuff with it. I think we can get back there. Um, tonight, you know, is, is can we commit those? Um, do we support uh, committing the, the um, FY23 and FY24 funds um, as the action plan currently um, lays out? That it would go to Sherman Gardens and also there's funding for the administrative costs um, and for fair housing uh, work. So the administrative costs go okay. into the planning department's budget, right? So since I'm taking minutes, Rachel, I just want to make sure I'm getting it correct. Okay. okay. What was that, Betsy? Um, since I'm taking minutes, I want to make sure I'm getting it correct here. Um, so question one is um, administration funds. Is that administration of the consortium? No, it's and Madeline, you're better at answering this. Their town uh, work on home, correct? Yes, that's right. That's the, so I just brought up the numbers. Um, so for FY23, the allocation is 58,000 with 5,000, a little over 5,000 going to the home administration pot um, for, you know, for use of administering this this program. You know, Gabe's work and others um, with reporting and, and monitoring and, and the such. Um, the project uh, funding is for 53185 this year. And do you also, could you read out um, FY24? I don't have F. I don't have FY24 in front of me. I just have FY23 and the uncommitted from prior years. Right. Okay. So that's my second question, just to make sure I'm noting what it is we would be um, potentially voting on. Um, are we voting on two um, sort of 50,000, but it sounds like it's a little more, yes. lots of money. And are mm -hmm. we voting on an additional that might be coming. That was, I got a little bit um, unclear when an additional one was mentioned. I don't think we're voting on the additional one yet um, for FY24. This is the FY23 projects. I, I think there were two years. FY, yeah. was, I'm, I, it's, that's, that's uncommitted from last year, from FY22. Yeah. Sorry, FY22 and FY23 then, Gloria, is yeah. that what you were gonna say? Right, it's the uncommitted from last year and the current year. Right. So we and, have, um, we have quite a bit of uncommitted funds from last year. Right. And is that, that's different than the amount you just read. So is it worth it if you have, anybody has it handy to just um, say aloud what the FY22 uncommitted funds are so I can put them in the notes here? So here, if, if you all want to track um, with the annual action plan, it's on page um, 137 of the, the, it's everybody's allocation. So we've got a significant portion of unspent funds from last year. We have 5,075 from the home administration pool from last year. We have 48,975 from Belmont projects and programs from last year. And then here it's listing Bradford Estates with 50,775. Yeah, that um, didn't end up happening. I think that was an idea, right, Gloria? Wasn't that something that was being put out as a potential to buy down another unit? Yeah, that thought yeah so there's been attempts to, to try, I think on behalf of our town, um, to buy down additional units forever, something new was coming. Um, but it, it hasn't worked yet. Yeah. So can I ask, just suggest something? If there's a way of forming a motion without using a specific dollar amount, because I think that we need to make sure that whatever, however we vote, the home consortium people are, you know, know that we voted to use this money, these two years of monies for Sherman Gardens. Um, I don't know if that's doable without being specific. I just don't want to, you know, we're saying 52-1 and they're saying, oh no, it was 49-7. No, I would be, right, because the, uh, the town is meeting with West Metro tomorrow, but they do need sign off. I think you're right to do it somewhat broadly. 
Um, we are going to be kicked out of the library soon, but because we have members of the public on, I do want to see if there's any questions or comments from uh, from the public before we move into any any motion. If there's not, that's okay. If there is, just want to make sure we're acknowledging it. Could, could someone, uh, this is Vince Stanton, could someone just state in, in two or three sentences what the uh, plan is at, at Sherman Garden? Is it to renovate or is it to take down what's there and replace it with something new and 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 Gloria. Uh, okay. So the plan is to replace it with something new. We're we're hoping to build right now there are 81 bedroom apartments. We would like to replace that with 125 uh, apartments in an elevator building, uh, as well as have some potentially have some additional, uh, we'll keep one of the buildings and use that for potentially other uses, whether it's for additional senior housing or for family housing, perhaps 10, 10 to 12 units of, of family housing, but it would be 125 apartments for seniors and those with disabilities. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Is there a motion that someone can uh, put together? You're always good at this, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I move that the Housing Trust vote to permit the FY22 and FY23 available home funding to Sherman Gardens pre-development activities. Does that work? Pre-development activities covers it all? Okay, good job. I second that. Right, Betsy, are you doing roll call? Do you want me to? Um, yeah, um, I will. I'm trying to go through who's public and who's not public on my screen. Um, and let's see, um, Judy. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Benny. Aye. Madeline. <clears throat> Aye. Tommy. Aye and myself, I, so it passes unanimously. Okay, we do also need to approve the actual FY24 action plan, um, which is the document that was sent out. Um, so I move that we um, approve the, what's the full title, the West Metro the West Consortium. The Metro Home Consortium. FY24 action plan. Getting late, people. <laughs> Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor, let's see, let's start at the top again. Um, Judy? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Tommy? Uh, Madeline? You're on mute. Yeah, I have a, I was just looking again. This is, again, the FY23 action plan or the, 24. I believe it's FY23. Gabe, yeah, I, because that's what, uh, let me see. I'm interested in the email specifically. Okay. Was FY24. Yeah, I have FY24 24? draft okay. home okay. budget. Yes. Uh, okay. Or do you, should we amend that motion and make it approve the, West Metro um, Home Consortium Action Plan and not name the year, even though we know the pending. Yeah, it's the one that's the draft. Um, would that make you feel more comfortable, Madeline? Yeah, yes, it would. Okay. Um, Can you restate that? It's the West, Mes West Metro FY24 Home Action Plan? Yes. Thank you. Draft. Draft. Yes. Action Plan. Yeah, leave the year out is what, you leave the year out is what we're doing. Yeah. It's the current draft. At it's this the time. current draft. Um, okay, let's start that again. Um, I second. And starting at the top, um, Judy. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Tommy. Tommy. You're Should muted. Uh, Madeline. Aye. Benny? Aye. It passes unanimously. Excellent. Uh, with no further business on the agenda, is there a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm.
move. Second. We're Thank out. Thank you, Rachel, for pulling this all together so quickly. Oh <laughs> Thank you all for making this work. I know this is not ideal, but and thank you for everyone who participated tonight. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Madeline. Welcome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt.